Ah, love. Described in literature, romanticized in the movies, the thing that makes the world go round. From its earliest descriptions, it seems that love has always been biologically linked to the heart. For centuries, the heart was described as the vessel of the soul and the center of emotions. This symbolism persists today, even if only in a symbolic fashion. Want to tell someone you love them, but too lazy to type the word? Use the heart emoji. But the true function of the heart is far less romantic. It's a pump, plain and simple, responsible for maintaining the circulation of blood throughout the body. Sorry to spoil the romantic idea for you. But despite this less than romantic role for the heart in the functioning of the body, it is still a marvelous piece of machinery that inspires awe and admiration in all that study it. It's also the subject of today's video podcast. Good day and welcome to today's video lecture on the structure and function of the heart. For the average person, the human heart will beat anywhere from 60 to 100 times per minute, meaning that by the time you hit 20 years of age, your heart will have beat an astounding 600 million times. But despite this rapidity and consistency, there's a great deal of complexity to the process. Well, we're going to try and unravel some of that complexity over the next three video sessions and make sense of this incredible machine. For this first session, we'll cover most of the intrinsic structures of the heart. We'll be covering a lot of ground this session, so buckle up, it's a long ride. We'll look at the structure of the chambers and the valves of the heart and how they ensure that one-way flow of blood is secure. We'll continue with a look at the coronary blood circulation and we'll discuss a number of clinical issues along the way. Cellular respiration is the process by which cells generate energy through the breakdown of nutrients in the presence of oxygen, and water and carbon dioxide is produced. This means that all living cells require a constant influx of nutrients and oxygen and the ability to eliminate waste products. For single cellular organisms, this is pretty straightforward as they can easily exchange these substances through simple diffusion. For multicellular organisms, however, this creates a problem as cells deep within a tissue can't rely on simple diffusion. To address this problem, most multicellular organisms have developed a circulatory system and the human is no different. Mammals rely on blood as a transport medium, passing through two looped circuits in series. In the pulmonary circuit, oxygen is exchanged for carbon dioxide, after which the blood travels through the systemic circuit to deliver the oxygen and collect waste from all tissues of the body. The heart serves the pump for the motion of blood through this closed series of circuits. Contraction of the chambers provides the driving force for the movement of blood, while the heart valves ensure proper one-way flow. The heart rests in the central part of the thoracic cavity between the pulmonary cavities. This central region is known as the mediastinum. The heart occupies the middle portion of the mediastinum lying in front of the descending aorta and esophagus, which occupy the inferior mediastinum. The superior mediastinum is noted for, among other things, the great vessels such as the ascending aorta, superior vena cava, and their tributaries. In the body walls and appendages, we see symmetry between the left and right sides of the body. Not quite the case for the body cavities. We'll see differences between the left and right chambers of the heart, and even the heart itself has an asymmetrical position in the mediastinum. The apex of the heart, which is the inferior tip of the ventricles, is directed towards the left side of the body. This is responsible for the cardiac impression, or cardiac notch, that we see in the left lung. The heart is anchored to the posterior thoracic wall through its connection to the great vessels. Notice that these connections are continuous, forming a semicircle along the right and superior margins of the inferior mediastinum. This creates something of an upside-down pocket called the oblique pericardial sinus. If you slip your hand deep to the apex of the heart and direct it superolaterally, as far as it will go, it will rest in the sinus against the anchor. Also notice that the apex and ventricles are more or less free-floating within the mediastinum. This is important to cardiac function, as the strong contractions produced by the ventricles would be restricted if this portion were anchored down. Similar to what we see with the lungs, as the heart develops, it migrates into a membrane-lined region that envelops the heart as it expands. 
creating a parietal layer in contact with the mediastinal walls and a visceral layer in contact with the heart itself. What's different in the case of the heart is the presence of an additional outer thick fibrous layer in exclusive contact with the parietal layer of membrane. Together, these two fused layers form the pericardial sac. The tough outer layer is referred to as the fibrous pericardium and the thin inner parietal membrane is called the serous pericardium. This image gives us a magnified view of the pericardial sac in the heart wall itself. Again, we see that outer fibrous pericardium and parietal serous membrane that form the pericardial sac. The visceral serous membrane can now be seen as the external layer of the heart and can also be referred to as epicardium. Remember though, using our fist in a balloon example, the epicardium or visceral pericardium, whichever term you want to use, is that inner portion of the balloon that comes into contact with the fist. Notice that there is a space between the parietal and visceral layers of pericardium. This pericardial space contains a small amount of serous fluid that contributes to a frictionless environment between the parietal and visceral serous layers. This is of critical importance. Remember, from the time the heart first starts beating early on in embryological development, and for the rest of a person's life, the heart is in constant motion. Any sort of friction or inflammation would be catastrophic to normal function. The middle layer of the heart wall is the myocardium. And this is the muscular portion of the heart which generates the propulsive force for circulation. If we look at the heart with the epicardium intact, you might not get an appreciation for the organization of the heart muscle. But with extensive and meticulous dissection, the fibers can be found spiraling around the atria and ventricles. Contraction of the myocardiocytes, therefore, produces a squeezing effect on the chambers to help with the ejection of blood. The innermost layer is known as the endocardium. This is a simple squamosal epithelial lining that is continuous with the endothelium lining in the blood vessels. The endocardium also lines the valves of the heart, which is a common site for endocarditis, or inflammation of the heart lining. Connective tissue also plays a critical role in the structure and function of the heart. The atrioventricular septum, which separates the atria from the ventricles, is composed of a thick collection of dense irregular connective tissue. This gives some structural support to the heart and serves as an anchoring point for the chambers. As we'll see later on, when discussing the conduction system of the heart, the atrioventricular septum also provides electrical insulation, allowing the atria and ventricles to contract independent of one another. More on that later. Finally, modifications of this connective tissue form the four separate valves of the heart. Two cuspid valves separate the atria from the septum, and two semilunar valves separate the ventricles from the two great arteries. Once again, more on that later. We're going to focus our attention now on the heart chambers. To help with conceptualization, the heart can be divided into left and right sides. The right side of the heart receives a venous return from systemic circulation and pushes it out to the pulmonary circuit. The left side is the opposite receiving blood from the pulmonary circuit and pushing it back out to the systemic circuit. On each side we have an atrium and a ventricle. Atrium is a Latin term meaning entrance hall and it's an appropriate name as it's where blood returning from the two circuits first collects. The atria then contract to prime the ventricles which drive the blood back into both systemic and pulmonary circulation. The left and right sides are each separated by the interatrial and interventricular septa which divides the heart into left and right sides and functionally separates the two circuits. In describing the chambers in detail, it's pretty customary to start with the right atrium as the starting point. And who are we to buck with tradition? This is the chamber that receives blood returning from systemic circulation. The right atrium receives blood from three different sources and the openings for all three can be easily observed. The most prominent are the two cavel openings which need to be severed when extracting the heart. The superior vena cava drains blood from the head, neck, upper limbs via the brachiocephalic veins and the thoracic wall via the azagous venous system. The inferior vena cava drains blood from the abdomen and lower limbs. A little more subtle is the opening for the coronary sinus, which drains blood from the coronary circulation supplying the heart itself. This can be found closer to the interatrial septum, 
the anterior wall of the right atrium has a fairly thick network of myocardial muscle, referred to as pecnate muscle. The superior most portion of the anterior wall folds up upon itself and projects downward over the inferior part of the atrium. It's called the auricle because of its resemblance to a dog's ear. This provides a little extra room for expansion during atrial filling. As we move posteriorly, the atrial wall thins out significantly. Remember, this is the attachment point for the caval openings, so not much room for contraction here. It's not a gradual thinning either. On the inner surface of the atrial wall, we can see a crescent-shaped bulge called the crista terminalis, which divides the anterior and posterior walls and serves as an anchoring point for the pectinate muscle. It also marks the location of the sinoatrial node near the atrial septum, which will be discussed later with the conduction system of the heart. One final structure to identify, the fossa ovalis. This is the thinnest point within the interatrial septum, and as the name implies, it's roughly oval in appearance. We'll discuss this in a little more detail towards the end of the session during a discussion about fetal circulation, because it marks the location of the foramen ovale, which interconnects the left and right atrium during fetal development. That will move us into the next chamber of our journey, the right ventricle. This is a bit thicker than the atrium and has some distinct features. First, the internal surface is smooth, yet highly convoluted into this muscular network known as the trabeculae carnae. This contributes to the powerful ventricular contraction that pushes blood into the pulmonary circuit. Three distinct protrusions of the trabeculae carnae, called the papillary muscles, serve as anchors for the three valve cusps that make up the right atrioventricular, or tricuspid valve. Each is anchored to a cusp leaflet through the thin tendinous cords known as chordae tendinae. We'll talk a little more about the structure and mechanisms of the different heart valves in just a little bit. Superiorly, by the interventricular septum, the trabeculae carnae smooths out, creating a region known as the infundibulum or conus arteriosus, which leads into the pulmonary trunk that sends deoxygenated blood to the lungs. At the base of the trunk is the semilunar pulmonary valve which closes in diastole to prevent the black flow of blood from the pulmonary trunk into the right ventricle. We pick things up with the return of reoxygenated blood from the lungs, which drain into the left atrium through two pairs of pulmonary veins, as demonstrated in this posterior view of a heart-lung block. The left atrium is similar in structure to the right. Although the wall tends to be a bit thicker, the chamber volume is lower, and there is no crista terminalis separating the pectinate muscle anteriorly from the smoother wall posteriorly. It just gradually blends in. From here, blood will move into the left ventricle. Again, similar features to the right ventricle, trabeculae carnae, papillary muscles, chordae tendinae, and so forth. But just like we saw with the left and right atria, there are distinct differences between the left and right ventricles. What stands out most is the thickness of the left ventricle compared to the right. Now, this makes sense when you think about it. Remember that the heart is a muscle, which means that the individual cells respond to heavy loads by growing in size, a process we call hypertrophy. The left side pumps out to systemic circulation against a systolic pressure of 120 millimeters of mercury. Pulmonary systolic pressure, on the other hand, is under 30 millimeters of mercury. So the right side experiences far less resistance. Think of it this way, if you were to go to the gym and bench press 120 pounds on a regular basis, you'd expect more muscle hypertrophy than if you bench pressed 30 pounds. Well, the same goes for the heart. Another big difference is with the number of valve cusps and papillary muscles with the left atrioventricular valve. On the right side, we had three cusps making up the tricuspid valve. On the left, there are only two, and so we have the bicuspid valve. This is also often referred to as the mitral valve because the two cusps resemble a mitre hat like the one worn by the Pope. Speaking of valves, time to take a look at these four structures in more detail. There are two distinct valve designs found in the heart. The two atrioventricular valves are found between the atria and ventricles on the left and right side of the heart and prevent the backflow of blood from the ventricles back into the atria. The semilunar valves are found at the base of the pulmonary trunk and aorta and prevent the backflow of blood into the right and left ventricles, respectively. We'll take a look at the cuspid valves first. We've already discussed the structure earlier in the video, 
The cusps themselves are an extension of the fibrous skeleton of the heart. They are composed of dense, irregular connective tissue lined with endocardium, similar to the rest of the inner surface of the heart. The cusps are anchored to the papillary muscle extensions of the ventricular walls through the collagen-rich chordae tendinae. In diastole, blood flows passively through the cuspid valves into the ventricles. In this phase, the cusps collapse passively into the ventricles with the flow of blood, offering no resistance. When the ventricles contract, blood is forced in the opposite direction and the valve cusps are pushed towards the atria. In this case, however, the cusps are tethered to the ventricular wall through the chordae tendinae, which prevents them from collapsing back into the atria. The entire thing works like a parachute when you think about it. Air collects under the parachute, similar to the blood that collects under the valve cusp. The anchoring of the parachute to the skydiver through cords prevents the chute from collapsing, just as the chordae tendinae anchored to the papillary muscle keeps the cusp from collapsing into the atria. The anchored cusps end up converging upon each other and effectively seal off the channel between atria and ventricles, preventing the backflow of blood from re-entering the atria when the ventricles contract. This now brings us to the semilunar valves. Their name is derived from their half-moon appearance to the early anatomists. They have some similarities to the cuspid valves. In both cases, the main connective tissue content is similar in composition and originates as an outgrowth of the fibrous skeleton of the heart. A major difference is in the geometry of the wall attachment. The cuspid valves are more or less linear, while the semilunar valve flaps have more of a curved attachment with the convex surface directed towards the ventricles. If we cut the tube open at the site of the valve and unrolled it, we'd see what looks like three small pockets forming the valve. Also note that there are no tendinous attachments to the valve flaps. Instead, we have thickening within the connective tissue at the midpoint of the flaps, known as nodules. Thinking of the semilunar valves as being made up of three pockets helps with the understanding of the mechanics behind their function. Take the pocket of my shirt, for example. Now, if I take my hand, place it below my pocket, and slide it up, I push the pocket flap flat against my chest. On the other hand, if I take my hand and I start to slide it back down, notice that my fingers get caught inside the pocket, and the flap starts to bulge outwards as more and more of my hand fills up the pocket. The same thing happens with the semilunar valves. When the ventricles contract, blood is forced into the pulmonary trunk and aorta, pushing the valve flaps flat against the side of these vessels and opening the valve. As the ventricles relax, the pressure decreases, and there is a tendency for blood at the base of these arteries to flow back towards the ventricles. As it does, it tends to collect in these three pockets, just like the fingers of my hand did. And just like we saw with the pocket of my shirt, the three flaps bulge outward towards one another, with the nodules of each flap converging in the middle. This seals off the lumen and stops blood from flowing back into the ventricles. So although the mechanics of the cuspid and semilunar valves are altogether different, they each serve the same function as one-way valves controlling the movement of blood through the heart. The cuspid valves open to allow blood to flow from the atria to the ventricles during diastole then snap shut as the ventricles contract to prevent blood from re-entering the atria. The semilunar valves, on the other hand, open during ventricular contraction to allow blood to move into the great arteries off the heart, then close during diastole to prevent the backflow of blood from these arteries back into the ventricles. Before we leave our discussion of the heart valves, let's take a few moments to reflect on some common valve diseases seen in the heart. Well, okay, before we can specifically talk about valvular diseases, we have to discuss a more general disease that can contribute to valvular disease. As the name implies, endocarditis refers to inflammation of the internal lining of the heart. There are a few things that can lead to endocarditis. Staphylococcus aureus and streptococcus are both known to cause endocarditis, particularly when there is microtrauma already present from normal wear and tear of the heart lining. Oral surgery and intravenous drug use both increase the risk of endocarditis due to the possible introduction of infectious agents directly into the bloodstream. Outside of infectious agents, endocarditis can also result from autoimmune disorders such as lupus, 
Treatment typically involves aggressive intravenous antibiotic treatment to limit the infection. Surgical valve replacement may be required if the inflammation results in permanent damage. If left untreated, endocarditis has a high mortality rate. Turning our focus to valve diseases, we'll start with a discussion of mitral valve prolapse, which describes the misalignment of one of the valve cups during closing of the mitral valve. Now, this can technically occur in any of the four valves, but is especially prevalent in the mitral valve. In fact, it is the most common valvular condition, affecting as much as 3% of the population. The condition results from breakdown of the connective tissue in one of the leaflets, resulting in elongation and thickening. This can occur in individuals with connective tissue disorders or as a complication of either endocarditis or rheumatic fever, among other causes. Whatever the case, the diseased leaflet tends to protrude into the left atrium during valve closure. This can result in inefficient closure of the mitral valve and the passage of blood back into the left atrium, a phenomenon known as valvular regurgitation. In many cases, the condition doesn't cause distress and a person can go their entire lives undiagnosed. In more severe cases, symptoms may include shortness of breath either during exercise or when lying down, general fatigue, and exercise intolerance. Auscultation, or listening with a stethoscope, can help with the diagnosis. This might be done as an initial inexpensive and non-invasive workup, or just incidentally as part of a routine physical exam. Valve prolapse tends to produce a clicking sound on auscultation as the valve snaps upward into the atrium. Regurgitation produces a swooshing sound that is medically described as a heart murmur. For further evaluation, an echocardiograph can visualize the valve in real time to identify prolapse. No intervention is required if there are minimal effects on cardiac function, but the patient should be monitored periodically for progression of the condition. In more severe cases, valve replacement is recommended to prevent comorbidities such as congestive heart failure, which results from the backup of blood into the pulmonary circuit. The next valve disease to address is stenosis which refers to a thickening of valve cusps due to fibrosis and hardening of the cusps from calcification. The condition typically occurs following repetitive bouts of endothelial damage and inflammation, as can be seen in endocarditis and rheumatic fever. Again, any of the four valves can be affected. On the left, stenosis of the pulmonary valve is shown schematically. With this disease, however, the aortic valve is most commonly affected. Here on the right, we can see a pathological case of stenosis, similar to valvular prolapse. The condition may be asymptomatic and go unnoticed, but it can result in diminished stroke volumes due to narrowing of the aortic valve opening during systole. This can result in dyspnea, or fainting, particularly during physical activity due to limitations in increased cardiac output. Over time, the increased pressures in the left ventricle can lead to left ventricular wall hypertrophy and ultimately heart failure. As with valvular prolapse, treatment of more severe cases involves a valve replacement surgery. Valve replacement techniques have improved dramatically over the past decade. Traditionally, the diseased tissue was removed and replaced with a mechanical valve while the patient was placed on bypass. More recently, a closed approach has been developed with bovine or porcine valves mounted on a metal or polymer platform. The apparatus is introduced in a collapsed form using a catheter. When placed in the appropriate position, the apparatus is deployed, which compresses the disease valve against the wall lumen. So more or less, within a single heartbeat, you have a new valve. The platform is then sutured in place and the catheter apparatus is removed. Next topic to discuss is coronary circulation. Just as we saw with the lungs, even though we have this oxygen-rich blood flow through the chambers of the heart, the tissue is too thick to allow for passive diffusion of blood gases. Instead, we have the left and right coronary arteries, which are the first two arterial branches off the aorta. Blood flow through these vessels is a little unique. The vessels come off the aorta at 90 degree angles, just superior to the aortic valve. Because of the high velocity at which blood is ejected from the left ventricle and the perpendicular flow, relatively little blood flows through the coronary circulation during systole. On the other hand, when the aortic valve closes during diastole, a positive pressure of 80 millimeters of mercury remains in the aorta 
that forces blood into coronary circulation. It's kind of like punching two holes into the sides of a plastic bottle full of water near its base. The pressure inside the bottle forces the water out of the holes. So what's unique is that the coronary vessels are the only arteries of the body that actually receive greater blood flow during diastole when compared to systole. This is probably at least one of the reasons that diastolic blood pressure is a better indication of coronary vascular health when compared to systolic blood pressure. There's obviously a large number of vessels that branch off the main coronary arteries and a fair bit of variability in how they run. We'll leave most of those to the vascular surgeons to worry about and focus on the main branches. The left coronary artery will almost immediately split into two principal branches. The anterior interventricular, also known as the left anterior descending, or LAD, is the most prominent branch on the anterior surface of the heart running in a small furrow between the left and right ventricles. The left circumflex branch passes posteriorly in a crevice between the left atrium and left ventricle. From here, it'll give off a number of branches that supply the posterior surface of the left ventricle. The right coronary artery will travel laterally in the crevice separating the right atrium and right ventricle, ultimately passing posteriorly as the right circumflex branch. Before it does, it gives off the marginal artery, which lies on the right lateral surface of the ventricles, supplying blood to this region. The circumflex branch continues along to give off the posterior interventricular branch, the most prominent branch along the posterior surface of the heart. This is the main supply for the posterior aspect of the right ventricle, as well as a large portion of the posterior left ventricle. Blood to the heart tissue is drained through the coronary veins. The great cardiac vein runs with the anterior interventricular artery and the middle cardiac vein with the posterior interventricular artery. Not shown here is the middle cardiac vein, which lies next to the right marginal artery, so feel free to draw it in yourself. These three branches, as well as the others we're not going to bother naming, all drain into the coronary sinus a large vessel that runs posteriorly between the left atrium and ventricle to empty into the right atrium. The exception are the anterior cardiac veins, which drain independently through small openings in the anterior wall of the right atrium. Okay, big clinical complication to discuss, blockage of the coronary vessels. These vessels tend to experience a lot of wear and tear, probably because they are these small little vessels coming right off the aorta by the left ventricle. As a result, they're subjected to the highest blood pressures in the body, which tends to damage the endothelial lining of the vessel. It heals up okay, but whenever these tears appear, lipids floating in the blood can get trapped under the endothelial lining and remain lodged after the lining heals over, leading to fatty streaks along the wall. Over time, these streaks build up as vascular plaques and create a protrusion, sort of like sweeping dirt under a rug. These protrusions project into the lumen of the vessel, which decreases the vessel diameter and restricts blood flow. Now, the vascular supply to the heart is rich, so a person can have over 50% occlusion of a major vessel and not experience any symptoms whatsoever. You get to around 70% blockage, and that's when oxygen supply begins to drop, especially during activity. The heart will start producing lactic acid that generates chest pain known as angina pectoris. This is typically treated by stopping physical activity to slow the heart down. And if the patient already has a diagnosis of coronary artery disease, they can take a prescribed nitroglycerin tablet to dilate the vessels and increase the blood flow. Here's the big problem with diagnosing coronary artery disease. You have a patient with recurring angina and a likely blockage in coronary circulation. So, how do you figure out the location of the blockage, or blockages? I mean, there could be more than one, right? This is where angiography comes in. A catheter is introduced percutaneously into one of the major arteries of either the arm or leg and is fed upstream through the aorta and ultimately to the base of one of the two coronary arteries. A radio-opaque dye is introduced and a brief series of radiographs or fluoroscopic images are taken to visualize the vascular lumen highlighted by the dye. Once the dye is flushed out of coronary circulation, the catheter is repositioned and the procedure is repeated for the other coronary artery.
careful examination of the radiographic images can identify stenosis or regions of vessel narrowing that might be responsible for the patient's angina. At this stage, the patient is likely going to turn to surgical intervention to correct the blockage. There's a few options available, depending on the location of the blockage, the number of vessels involved, and the overall health of the patient. One common technique is angioplasty. The procedure is similar to angiography, with a catheter being fed percutaneously through the coronary vessels. In this case, however, it's a balloon catheter with a deflated balloon apparatus near the tip. The catheter is then advanced through the affected vessels and positioned with the balloon placed at the site of blockage. The balloon is then briefly inflated, which compresses the plaque creating the blockage and restores the diameter of the lumen. In most procedures, the catheter is fitted with a metal stent over the balloon that expands with the balloon and remains in place to help maintain the luminal diameter. Angioplasty is a minimally invasive and relatively safe procedure, but blockages may be too numerous or in locations that are not realistically accessible to balloon catheters. In these instances, coronary artery bypass grafts, commonly referred to as CABG or cabbage surgeries, can be performed. As the name implies, a tissue graft is harvested, typically the great saphenous or other cutaneous vein from the leg and it's sutured to the aorta at one end and to the diseased vessel past the site blockage on the other. As a result, blood can flow around the blockage to maintain perfusion of cardiac tissue. If you studied vascular microstructure, you'll know that venous walls are thinner and less elastic than arterial walls, and you might wonder how they fare with the high pressures they would now be under. Well, pretty good actually. This is living vascular tissue, and over time, the walls become arterialized, thickening and becoming more elastic in response to the arterial pressure they are under. Another common technique for an anterior interventricular graft is the left internal mammillary artery, or lima graft. The name is a bit unfortunate. Internal mammillary is an antiquated term for the internal thoracic artery. In this technique, the left internal thoracic artery is liberated and transected in the mid-thoracic region and grafted to the anterior interventricular artery. A big advantage of this approach is that it involved only a single graft point. The artery remains attached at its origin to the subclavian vein. And because of the extensive anastomoses that exist, including with the superior and inferior epigastric arteries, ligating the internal thoracic artery does not compromise blood flow to the anterior thoracic wall. Alright, so that's how we deal with compromised blood flow to the coronary arteries before things get really bad. But what happens when things do get really bad? If there is severe deficiency in oxygen supply, which can happen when a plaque breaks off and completely blocks a downstream vessel, the heart tissue supplied by the blocked artery will become necrotic and die. This is known as myocardial infarction, or more informally, a heart attack. As a necrotic tissue breaks down, cardiac-specific enzymes are released into the blood, which can be detected in blood assays to assist in making a diagnosis. The severity of an MI depends on both the location and the size of the infarct, with larger infarcts being more serious and potentially fatal. Even with non-fatal MIs, the damaged heart tissue is replaced with scar tissue, meaning that the efficiency of the heart decreases and the remaining tissue must work harder to compensate. For someone that already has heart disease, this leads to a vicious cycle of deteriorating heart function. Ultimately, the heart may reach a state where it cannot pump enough blood to keep up with the blood returning from venous circulation, a condition known as heart failure. The most common form is left-sided heart failure. In this condition, there is a backup of blood in pulmonary circulation because the left ventricle is not pumping efficiently enough to clear all of the blood returning to it. This leads to pulmonary edema and fluid accumulation in the lungs, which is known as congestive heart failure. Right-sided heart failure can occur as well. In this case, the right ventricle is compromised and blood accumulates in the systemic venous system. With right-sided heart failure, we see venous distension and the accumulation of fluid in the peripheral tissues. This is sometimes also called pitting edema because of the temporary depressions that are made after pressing in on the tissue. Okay, before we wrap up this session, we have to pause for a second and appreciate the variability we see in the body. 
What I just described to you, the posterior interventricular artery branching from the right coronary artery, is true for roughly 70% of the population. We call this right dominance of the heart. But of course, if it happens in 70% of the population, it doesn't happen in 30%. So what's going on here? Well, in 10% of the population, the posterior interventricular artery actually stems from the left coronary artery. And in these situations, we refer to it as a left dominant heart. In the remaining 20% of the population, we have co-dominance, where both left and right arteries feed into the posterior interventricular artery to some extent. The type of dominance in a given heart can have a major impact on the severity of a myocardial infarction. For left dominant individuals, for example, the blockages in left coronary circulation are potentially more severe compared to right dominant individuals due to the surface area that is covered. Those with co-dominance have a protective advantage, since the anastomosis between left and right branches means that blood can potentially be rerouted around a blockage in either major branch feeding the posterior interventricular artery. Oh, okay, that'll do it for this marathon session on heart structure and function. Technically, though, we're not done yet. We haven't talked about innervation to the heart. We'll look at this in the next session and how all of these pieces fit together to generate a heartbeat. We'll see you then.